This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Five, Part One. Towards the close of the reign of Charles the Second, some Whigs, who had been deeply implicated in the plot so fatal to their party, and who knew themselves to be marked out for destruction, had sought an asylum in the Low Countries. These refugees were, in general, men of fiery temper and weak judgment. They were also, under the influence of that peculiar illusion which seems to belong to their situation, politician driven into banishment by a hostile faction, generally sees the society which he has quitted through a false medium. Every object is distorted and discoloured by his regrets, his longings, and his resentments. Every little discontent appears to him to portend a revolution. Every riot is a rebellion. He cannot be convinced that his country does not pine for him, as much as he pines for his country. He imagines that all his old associates, who still dwell at their homes and enjoy their estates, are tormented by the same feelings which make life a burden to himself. The longer his expatriation, the greater does this hallucination become. The lapse of time, which cools the ardour of the friends whom he has left behind, inflames his. Every month his impatience to revisit his native land increases, and every month his native land remembers and misses him less. This delusion becomes almost a madness, when many exiles who suffer in the same cause herd together in a foreign country. Their chief employment is to talk of what once they were, and of what they may yet be to goad each other into animosity against the common enemy, to feed each other with extravagant hopes of victory and revenge. Thus they become ripe for enterprises which would at once be pronounced hopeless by any man whose passions had not deprived him of the power of calculating chances. In this mood were many of the outlaws who had assembled on the continent. The correspondence which they kept up with England was, for the most part, such as tended to excite their feelings and to mislead their judgment. Their information concerning the temper of the public mind was chiefly derived from the worst members of the Whig party, from men who were plotters and libellers by profession, who were pursued by the officers of the justice, who were forced to skulk in disguise through back streets, and who sometimes lay hid for weeks together in cocklofts and cellars. The statesmen who had formerly been the ornaments of the country party, the statesmen who afterwards guided the councils of the convention, would have given advice very different from that which was given by such men as John Wildman and Henry Danvers. Wildman had served forty years before in the parliamentary army, but had been more distinguished there as an agitator than as a soldier, and had early quitted the profession of arms for pursuits better suited to his temper. His hatred of monarchy had induced him to engage in a long series of conspiracies, first against the protector, and then against the Stuarts. But with Wildman's fanaticism was joined a tender care for his own safety. He had a wonderful skill in grazing the edge of treason. No man understood better how to instigate others to desperate enterprises by words which, when repeated to a jury, might seem innocent, or, at worst, ambiguous. Such was his cunning, that though always plotting, though always known to be plotting, and though long malignantly watched by a vindictive government, he eluded every danger, and died in his bed, after having seen two generations of his accomplices die on the gallows. Danvers was a man of the same class, hot-headed but faint-hearted, constantly urged to the brink of danger by enthusiasm, and constantly stopped on that brink by cowardice. He had considerable influence among a portion of the Baptists, 
had written largely in defence of their peculiar opinions, and had drawn down on himself the severe censure of the most respectable Puritans by attempting to palliate the crimes of Matthias and John of Leyden. It is probable that, had he possessed a little courage, he would have trodden in the footsteps of the wretches whom he defended. He was, at this time, concealing himself from the officers of justice, for warrants were out against him on account of a grossly calumnous paper of which the government had discovered him to be the author. It is easy to imagine what kind of intelligence and counsel men such as have been described were likely to send to the outlaws in the Netherlands. Of the general character of those outlaws an estimate may be formed from a few samples. One of the most conspicuous amongst them was John Ayloff a lawyer connected by affinity with the Hydes, and through the Hydes with James. Iloff had made himself remarkable by offering a whimsical insult to the government, at a time when the ascendancy of the court of Versailles had excited general uneasiness. He had contrived to put a wooden shoe, the established type among the English, of French tyranny, into the chair of the House of Commons. He had subsequently been concerned in the Whig plot, but there is no reason to believe that he was a party to the design of assassinating the royal brothers. He was a man of parts and courage, but his moral character did not stand high. The Puritan divines whispered that he was a careless Gallio, or something worse, and that whatever zeal he might profess for civil liberty, the saints would do well to avoid all connection with him. Nathaniel Wade was, like Iloff, a lawyer. He had long resided at Bristol, and had been celebrated in his own neighbourhood as a vehement Republican. At one time he had formed a project of emigrating to New Jersey, where he expected to find institutions better suited to his taste than those of England. His activity in electioneering had introduced him to the notice of some Whig nobles. They had employed him professionally, and had, at length, admitted him to their most secret councils. He had been deeply concerned in the scheme of insurrection, and had undertaken to head a rising in his own city. He had also been privy to the more odious plot against the lives of Charles and James, but he always declared that, though privy to it, he had abhorred it, and had attempted to dissuade his associates from carrying their design into effect. For a man bred to civil pursuits, Wade seems to have had, in an unusual degree, that sort of ability and that sort of nerve which make a good soldier. Unhappily, his principles and his courage proved to be not of sufficient force to support him when the fight was over, and when, in a prison, he had to choose between death and infamy. Another fugitive was Richard Goodenough, who had formerly been under Sheriff of London. On this man his party had long relied for services of no honourable kind, and especially for the selection of jurymen not likely to be troubled with scruples in political cases. He had been deeply concerned in those dark and atrocious parts of the Whig plot, which had been carefully concealed from the most respectable Whigs. Nor is it possible to plead, in extenuation of his guilt, that he was misled by inordinate zeal for the public good, for it will be seen that after having disgraced a noble cause by his crimes, he betrayed it in order to escape from his well-merited punishment. Very different was the character of Richard Rumbold. He had held a commission in Cromwell's own regiment, had guarded the scaffold before the banqueting-house on the day of the great execution, had fought at Dunbar and Worcester, and had always shown, in the highest degree, the qualities which distinguished the invincible army in which he served. Courage, of the truest temper, fiery enthusiasm, both political and religious, and with that enthusiasm all the power of self-government, which is characteristic of men trained in well-disciplined camps to command and to obey. When the Republican troops were disbanded, Rumbold became a maltster, and carried on his trade near Hodston. In that building from which the Rye House plot derives its name, it had been suggested, though not absolutely determined, in the conferences of the most violent and unscrupulous of the malcontents, that armed men should be stationed in the Rye House 
to attack the guards who were to escort Charles and James from Newmarket to London. In these conferences, Rumbold had borne a part from which he would have shrunk with horror, if his clear understanding had not been overclouded, and his manly heart corrupted by party spirit. A more important exile was Ford Grey, Lord Grey of Wark. He had been a zealous exclusionist, had concurred in the design of insurrection, and had been committed to the Tower, but had succeeded in making his keepers drunk, and in effecting his escape to the Continent. His parliamentary abilities were great, and his manners pleasing, but his life had been sullied by a great domestic crime. His wife was a daughter of the noble house of Berkeley. Her sister, the Lady Henrietta Berkeley, was allowed to associate and correspond with him, as with the brother by blood. A fatal attachment sprang up. The high spirit and strong passions of Lady Henrietta broke through all the restraints of virtue and decorum. A scandalous elopement disclosed to the whole kingdom the shame of two illustrious families. Grey and some of his agents who had served him, in his amour, were brought to trial on a charge of conspiracy. A scene unparalleled in our legal history was exhibited in the court of King's Bench. The seducer appeared with dauntless front, accompanied by his paramour. Nor did the great Whig lords flinch from their friend's side, even in that extremity. Those whom he had wronged stood over against him, and were moved to transports of rage by the sight of him. The old Earl of Berkeley poured forth reproaches and curses on the wretched Henrietta. The Countess gave evidence broken by many sobs, and at length fell down in a swoon. The jury found a verdict of guilty. When the court rose, Lord Berkeley called on all his friends to help him to seize his daughter. The partisans of Grey rallied round her. Swords were drawn on both sides. A skirmish took place in Westminster Hall, and it was with difficulty that the judges and tipstaves parted the combatants. In our time such a trial would be fatal to the character of a public man, but in that age the standard of morality among the great was so low, and party spirit was so violent, that Grey still continued to have considerable influence. Though the Puritans, who formed a strong section of the Whig party, looked somewhat coldly on him. One part of his character or rather it may be of the fortune of Grey, deserves notice. It was admitted that everywhere, except on the field of battle, he showed a high degree of courage. More than once, in embarrassing circumstances, when his life and liberty were at stake, the dignity of his deportment, and the perfect command of all his faculties, extorted praise from those who neither loved nor esteemed him. But as a soldier, he incurred less, perhaps, by his fault than by mischance, the degrading imputation of personal cowardice. In this respect, he differed widely from his friend the Duke of Monmouth. Ardent and intrepid on the field of battle, Monmouth was everywhere else effeminate and irresolute. The accident of his birth, his personal courage, and his superficial graces, had placed him in a post for which he was altogether unfitted. After witnessing the ruin of the party, and of which he had been the nominal head, he had retired to Holland. The Prince and Princess of Orange had now ceased to regard him as a rival. They received him most hospitably, for they hoped that by treating him with kindness they should establish a claim to the gratitude of his father. They knew that paternal affection was not yet wearied out, that letters and supplies of money still came secretly from Whitehall to Monmouth's retreat, and that Charles frowned on those who sought to pay their court to him by speaking ill of his banished son. The Duke had been encouraged to expect that, in a very short time, if he gave no new cause of displeasure, he would be recalled to his native land, and restored to all his high honours and commands. Animated by such expectations, he had been the life of the Hague during the late winter. He had been the most conspicuous figure at a succession of balls in that splendid orange hall, which blazes on every side with the most ostentatious colouring of Jordans and Honthurst. He had taught the English country dance to the Dutch ladies, and had, in his turn, learned from them to skate on the canals. The princess had accompanied him 
in his expeditions on the ice, and the figure which he made there, poised on one leg and clad in petticoats shorter than they are generally worn by ladies so strictly decorous, had caused some wonder and mirth to the foreign ministers. The sullen gravity which had been the characteristic of the stadtholder's court seemed to have vanished before the influence of the fascinating Englishman. Even the stern and pensive William relaxed into good humour when his brilliant guest appeared. Monmouth, meanwhile, carefully avoided all that could give offence in the quarter to which he looked for protection. He saw little of any Whigs, and nothing of those violent men he had been concerned with in the worst part of the Whig plot. He was therefore loudly accused by his old associates of fickleness and ingratitude. By none of the exiles was this accusation urged with more vehemence and bitterness than by Robert Ferguson, the Judas of Dryden's great satire. Ferguson was by birth a Scot, but England had long been his residence. At the time of the Restoration, indeed, he had held a living in Kent. He had been bred a Presbyterian, but the Presbyterians had cast him out, and he had become an independent. He had been master of an academy which the dissenters had set up at Islington as a rival to Westminster School and the Charter House, and he had preached to large congregations at a meeting-house in Moorfields. He had also published some theological treatises, which may still be found in the dusty recesses of a few old libraries. But, though texts of scripture were always on his lips, those who had pecuniary transactions with him soon found him to be a mere swindler. At length he turned his attention almost entirely from theology, to the worst part of politics. He belonged to the class whose office it is to render in troubled times to exasperated parties those services from which honest men shrink in disgust and prudent men in fear, the class of fanatical knaves, violent, malignant, regardless of truth, insensible to shame, insatiable of notoriety, delighting in intrigue, in tumult, in mischief for its own sake. He toiled during many years in the darkest minds of faction. He lived among libellers and false witnesses. He was the keeper of a secret purse from which agents too vile to be acknowledged received hire, and the director of a secret press whence pamphlets bearing no name were daily issued. He boasted that he had contrived to scatter lampoons about the terrace of Windsor, and even to lay them under the royal pillow. In this way of life he was put to many shifts, was forced to assume many names, and at one time had four different lodgings in different corners of London. He was deeply engaged in the Rye House plot. There is indeed reason to believe that he was the original author of those sanguinary schemes which brought so much discredit on the whole Whig party. When the conspiracy was detected, and his associates were in dismay, he bade them farewell with a laugh, and told them that they were novices, that he had been used to flight, concealment, and disguise, and that he should never leave off plotting while he lived. He escaped to the continent, but it seemed that even on the continent he was not secure. The English envoys at foreign courts were directed to be on the watch for him. The French government offered a reward of five hundred pistoles to any one who would seize him. Nor was it easy for him to escape notice, for his broad Scotch accent, his tall and lean figure, his lantern jaws, the gleam of his sharp eyes, which were always overhung by his wig, his cheeks inflamed by an eruption, his shoulders deformed by a stoop, and his gait distinguished from that of other men by a peculiar shuffle, made him remarkable wherever he appeared. But, though he was, as it seemed, pursued with peculiar animosity, it was whispered that this animosity was feigned, and that the officers of justice had secret orders not to see him. That he was really a bitter malcontent can scarcely be doubted, but there is strong reason to believe that he provided for his own safety by pretending at Whitehall to be a spy on the Whigs, and by furnishing the government with just so much information as sufficed to keep up his credit. This hypothesis furnishes a simple explanation of what seemed to his associates to be his unnatural recklessness and audacity. Being himself out of danger, he always gave his vote 
for the most violent and perilous course, and sneered very complacently at the pusillanimity of men who, not having taken the infamous precautions on which he relied, were disposed to think twice before they placed life, and objects dearer than life, on a single hazard. As soon as he was in the Low Countries, he began to form new projects against the English government, and found among his fellow emigrants men ready to listen to his evil counsels. Monmouth, however, stood obstinately aloof, and without the help of Monmouth's immense popularity, it was impossible to effect anything. Yet such was the impatience and rashness of the exiles, that they tried to find another leader. They sent an embassy to that solitary retreat on the shores of Lake Leman, where Edmund Ludlow, once conspicuous among the chiefs of the parliamentary army, and among the members of the High Court of Justice, had, during many years, hidden himself from the vengeance of the restored Stuarts. The stern old regicide, however, refused to quit his hermitage. His work, he said, was done. If England was still to be saved, she must be saved by younger men. End of part one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Luoma. GreenKRI.com. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Five. Part Two. The unexpected demise of the crown changed the whole aspect of affairs. Any hope which the proscribed Whigs might have cherished of returning peaceably to their native land was extinguished by the death of a careless and good-natured prince, and by the accession of a prince obstinate in all things, and especially obstinate in revenge. Ferguson was in his element. Destitute of the talents both of a writer and of a statesman, he had in a high degree the unenviable qualifications of a tempter. And now, with the malevolent activity and dexterity of an evil spirit, he ran from outlaw to outlaw, chattered in every ear, and stirred up in every bosom savage animosities and wild desires. He no longer despaired of being able to seduce Monmouth. The situation of that unhappy young man was completely changed. While he was dancing and skating at the Hague, and expecting every day a summons to London, he was overwhelmed with misery by the tidings of his father's death, and of his uncle's accession. During the night which followed the arrival of the news, those who lodged near him could distinctly hear his sobs and his piercing cries. He quitted the Hague the next day, having solemnly pledged his word both to the prince and to the princess of Orange not to attempt anything against the government of England, and having been supplied by them with money to meet immediate demands. The prospect which lay before Monmouth was not a bright one. There was now no probability that he would be recalled from banishment. On the continent his life could no longer be passed amidst the splendor and festivity of a court. His cousins at the Hague seemed to have really regarded him with kindness, but they could no longer countenance him openly, without serious risk of producing a rupture between England and Holland. William offered a kind and judicious suggestion. The war which was then raging in Hungary, between the Emperor and the Turks, was watched by all Europe with interest almost as great as that which the Crusades had excited five hundred years earlier. Many gallant gentlemen, both Protestant and Catholic, were fighting as volunteers in the common cause of Christendom. The prince advised Monmouth to repair to the imperial camp, and assured him that if he would do so, he should not want the means of making an appearance befitting an English nobleman. This counsel was excellent, but the duke could not make up his mind. He retired to Brussels accompanied by Henrietta Wentworth, Baroness Wentworth of Nittlesteed, a damsel of high rank and ample fortune, who loved him passionately, who had sacrificed for his sake her maiden honour and the hope of a splendid alliance, who had followed him into exile, and whom he believed to be his wife in the sight of heaven. 
Under the soothing influence of female friendship, his lacerated mind healed fast. He seemed to have found happiness in obscurity and repose, and to have forgotten that he had been the ornament of a splendid court, and the head of a great party, that he had commanded armies, and that he had aspired to a throne. But he was not suffered to remain quiet. Ferguson employed all his powers of temptation. Gray, who knew not where to turn for a pistol, and was ready for any undertaking, however desperate, lent his aid. No art was spared which could draw Monmouth from retreat. To the first invitations which he received from his old associates, he returned unfavorable answers. He pronounced that the difficulties of a descent on England insuperable, protested that he was sick of public life, and begged to be left in the enjoyment of his newly found happiness. But he was little in the habit of resisting skillful and urgent importunity. It is said, too, that he was induced to quit his retirement by the same powerful influence which had made that retirement delightful. Lady Wentworth wished to see him a king. Her rents, her diamonds, her credit were put at his disposal. Monmouth's judgment was not convinced, but he had not the firmness to resist such solicitations. By the English exiles he was joyfully welcomed, and unanimously acknowledged as their head. But there was another class of emigrants who were not disposed to recognize his supremacy. The misgovernment such as had never been known in the southern part of our island had driven from Scotland to the continent many fugitives, the intemperance of whose political and religious zeal was proportioned to the oppression which they had undergone. These men were not willing to follow an English leader. Even in destitution and exile they retained their punctilious national pride, and would not consent that their country should be, in their persons, degraded into a province. They had a captain of their own, Archibald, ninth Earl of Argyle, who, as chief of the great tribe of Campbell, was known among the population of the Highlands by the proud name of Macallum Moore. His father, the Marquess of Argyle, had been the head of the Scotch Covenanters, had greatly contributed to the ruin of Charles I, and was not thought by the Royalists to have atoned for this offence by consenting to bestow the empty title of king, and a state prison in a palace on Charles II. After the return of the royal family the Marquess was put to death. His Marquisat became extinct but his son was permitted to inherit the ancient earldom, and was still among the greatest, if not the greatest, of the nobles of Scotland. The earl's conduct during the twenty years which followed the restoration had been, as he afterwards thought, criminally moderate. He had on some occasions opposed the administration which afflicted his country, but his opposition had been languid and cautious. His compliances in ecclesiastical matters had given scandal to rigid Presbyterians, and so far he had been from showing any inclination to resistance that, when the Covenanters had been persecuted into insurrection, he had brought into the field a large body of his dependents to support the government. Such had been his political course until the Duke of York came down to Edinburgh armed with the whole regal authority, the despotic viceroy soon found that he could not expect entire support from Argyle. Since the most powerful chief in the kingdom could not be gained, it was thought necessary that he should be destroyed. On grounds so frivolous that even the spirit of party and the spirit of chicane were ashamed of them, he was brought to trial for treason, convicted, and sentenced to death. The partisans of the Stuarts afterwards asserted that it was never meant to carry this sentence into effect, and that the only object of the prosecution was to frighten him into ceding his extensive jurisdiction in the Highlands. Whether James designed, as his enemies suspected, to commit murder, or only, as his friends affirmed, to commit extortion by threatening to commit murder, cannot now be ascertained. "'I know nothing of the Scotch law,' said Halifax to King Charles." But this I know, that we should not hang a dog here on the grounds on which my lord Argyle has been sentenced. Argyle escaped in disguise to England, and thence passed over to Friesland. In that secluded province his father had bought a small estate, as a place of refuge for the family in civil troubles. 
It was said among the Scots that this purchase had been made in consequence of the predictions of a Celtic seer, to whom it had been revealed that Macallum Moore would one day be driven forth from the ancient mansion of his race at the Inverary. But it is probable that the politic Marquess had been warned rather by the signs of the times than by the visions of any prophet. The Friesland Earl Archibald resided during some time so quietly that it was not generally known whither he had fled. From his retreat he carried on a correspondence with his friends in Great Britain, was a party to the Whig conspiracy, and concerted with the chiefs of that conspiracy a plan for invading Scotland. This plan had been dropped upon the detection of the Rye House plot, but became again the subject of his thoughts after the demise of the Crown. He had, during his residence on the Continent, reflected much more deeply on religious questions than in the preceding years of his life. In one respect the effect of these reflections on his mind had been pernicious. His partiality for the synodical form of church government now amounted to bigotry. When he remembered how long he had conformed to the established worship, he was overwhelmed with shame and remorse, and showed too many signs of a disposition to atone for his defection by violence and intolerance. He had, however, in no long time an opportunity of proving that the fear and love of a higher power had nerved him for the most formidable conflicts by which human nature can be tried. To his companions in adversity his assistance was of the highest moment. Though proscribed and a fugitive, he was still in some sense the most powerful subject in the British dominions. In wealth, even before his attainder, he was probably inferior, not only to the great English nobles, but to some of the opulent esquires of Kent and Norfolk. But his patriarchal authority, an authority which no wealth could give, and which no attainder could take away, made him as a leader of an insurrection truly formidable. No southern lord could feel any confidence that if he ventured to resist the government, even his own gamekeepers and huntsmen would stand by him. An earl of Bedford, an earl of Devonshire, could not engage to bring ten men into the field. Macallum Moore, penniless and deprived of his earldom, might at any moment raise a serious civil war. He had only to show himself on the coast of Lorne, and an army would, in a few days, gather round him. The force which, in favourable circumstances, he could bring into the field amounted to five thousand fighting men, devoted to his service, accustomed to the use of target and broadsword, not afraid to encounter regular troops even in the open plain, and perhaps superior to regular troops in the qualifications requisite for the defence of wild mountain passes, hidden in mist, and torn by headlong torrents. What such a force, well directed, could effect, even against veteran regiments and skilful commanders, was proved, a few years later, at Killiecrankie. But strong as was the claim of Argyle to the confidence of the exiled Scots, there was a faction among them which regarded him with no friendly feeling, and which wished to make use of his name and influence without entrusting to him any real power. The chief of this faction was a lowland gentleman, who had been implicated in the Whig plot, and had with difficulty eluded the vengeance of the court, Sir Patrick Hume of Polwarth, in Berwickshire. Great doubt has been thrown on his integrity, but without sufficient reason. It must, however, be admitted that he injured his cause by perverseness as much as he could have done by treachery. He was a man incapable alike of leading and of following, conceited, captious, and wrong-headed, an endless talker, a sluggard in action against the enemy, and active only against his own allies. With Hume was closely connected another Scottish exile of great note, who had many of the same faults, Sir John Cochrane, second son of the Earl of Dundonald. A far higher character belonged to Andrew Fletcher of Saltoun, a man distinguished by learning and eloquence, distinguished also by courage, disinterestedness, and public spirit, but of an irritable and impracticable temper. Like many of his most illustrious contemporaries, Milton, for example, Harrington, Marvel, and Sidney, Fletcher had, from the misgovernment of several successive princes, conceived a strong aversion to hereditary monarchy. Yet he was no democrat. 
He was the head of an ancient Norman house, and was proud of his descent. He was a fine speaker and a fine writer, and was proud of his intellectual superiority. Both in his character of gentleman, and in his character of scholar, he looked down with disdain on the common people, and was so little disposed to entrust them with political power that he thought them unfit even to enjoy personal freedom. It is a curious circumstance that this man, the most honest, fearless, and uncompromising republican of his time, should have been the author of a plan for reducing a large part of the working classes of Scotland to slavery. He bore, in truth, a lively resemblance to those Roman senators who, while they hated the name of king, guarded the privileges of their order with inflexible pride against the encroachments of the multitude, and governed their bondmen and bondwomen by means of the stocks and the scourge. Amsterdam was the place where the leading emigrants, Scotch and English, assembled. Argyle repaired thither from Friesland, Monmouth from Brabant it soon appeared that the fugitives had scarcely anything in common except hatred of James and impatience to return from banishment. The Scots were jealous of the English, the English of the Scots. Monmouth's high pretensions were offensive to Argyle, who, proud of ancient nobility and of a legitimate descent from kings, was by no means inclined to do homage to the offspring of a vagrant and ignoble love. But of all the dissensions by which the little band of outlaws was distracted, the most serious was that which arose between Argyle and a portion of his own followers. Some of the Scottish exiles had, in a long course of opposition to tyranny, been excited into a morbid state of understanding and temper, which made the most just and necessary restraint insupportable to them. They knew that without Argyle they could do nothing. They ought to have known that, unless they wished to run headlong into ruin, they must either repose full confidence in their leader, or relinquish all thought of military enterprise. Experience has fully proved that in war every operation, from the greatest to the smallest, ought to be under the absolute direction of one mind, and that every subordinate agent, in his degree, ought to obey implicitly, strenuously, and with a show of cheerfulness, orders which he disapproves, or of which the reason are kept secret from him. Representative assemblies, public discussions, and all the other checks by which, in civil affairs, rulers are restrained from abusing power, are out of place in a camp. Machiavel justly imputed many of the disasters of Venice and Florence to the jealousy which led those republics to interfere with every one of their generals. The Dutch practice of sending to an army deputies, without whose consent no great blow could be struck, was almost equally pernicious. It is undoubtedly by no means certain that a captain, who has been entrusted with dictatorial power in the hour of peril, will quietly surrender that power in the hour of triumph. And this is one of the many considerations which ought to make men hesitate long before they resolve to vindicate public liberty by the sword but if they determine to try the chance of war, they will, if they are wise, entrust to their chief that plenary authority without which war cannot be well conducted. It is possible that, if they give him that authority, he may turn out a Cromwell or a Napoleon, but it is almost certain that if they withhold from him that authority, their enterprises will end like the enterprise of Argyle. End of part two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrated by Sean McKinley. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay Book One, Chapter Five, Part Three Some of the Scottish immigrants, heated with republican enthusiasm, and utterly destitute of the skill necessary to the conduct of great affairs, employed all their industry and ingenuity 
not in collecting means for the attack which they were about to make on a formidable enemy, but in devising restraints on their leader's power and securities against his ambition. The self-complacent stupidity with which they insisted on organizing an army as if they had been organizing a commonwealth would be incredible if it had not been frankly and even boastfully recorded by one of themselves. At length all differences were compromised. It was determined that an attempt should be forthwith made on the western coast of Scotland, and that it should be promptly followed by a descent on England. Argyle was to hold the nominal command in Scotland, but he was placed under the control of a committee which reserved to itself all the most important parts of the military administration. The committee was empowered to determine where the expedition should land, to appoint officers, to superintend the levying of troops, to dole out provisions and ammunition. All that was left to the general was to direct the evolutions of the army in the field, and he was forced to promise that even in the field, except in the case of a surprise, he would do nothing without the assent of a council of war. Monmouth was to command in England. His soft mind had, as usual, taken an impress from the society which surrounded him. Ambitious hopes, which had seemed to be extinguished, revived in his bosom. He remembered the affection with which he had been constantly greeted by the common people in town and country, and expected that they would now rise by hundreds of thousands to welcome him. He remembered the good will which the soldiers had always borne him, and flattered himself that they would come over to him by regiments. Encouraging messages reached him in quick succession from London. He was assured that the violence and injustice with which the elections had been carried on had driven the nation mad, that the prudence of the leading Whigs had with difficulty prevented a sanguinary outbreak on the day of the coronation and that all the great lords who had supported the exclusion bill were impatient to rally round him. Wildman, who loved to talk treason in parables, sent to say that the Earl of Richmond, just two hundred years before, had landed in England with a handful of men, and had a few days later been crowned on the field of Bosworth with a diadem taken from the head of Richard. Danvers undertook to raise the city. The Duke was deceived into the belief that, as soon as he had set up his standards, Bedfordshire, Buckinghamshire, Hampshire, Cheshire, would rise in arms. He consequently became eager for the enterprise from which a few weeks before he had shrunk. His countrymen did not impose on him restrictions so elaborately absurd as those which the Scotch immigrants had devised. All that was required of him was to promise that he would not assume the regal title till his pretensions had been submitted to the judgment of a free parliament. It was determined that two Englishmen, Eiloff and Rumbold, should accompany Argyle to Scotland, and that Fletcher should go with Monmouth to England. Fletcher, from the beginning, had augured ill of the enterprise, but his chivalrous spirit would not suffer him to decline a risk which his friends seemed eager to encounter. When Gray repeated with approbation what Wildman had said about Richmond and Richard, the well-read and thoughtful Scot justly remarked that there was a great difference between the fifteenth century and the seventeenth. Richmond was assured of the support of barons, each of whom could bring an army of feudal retainers into the field, and Richard had not one regiment of regular soldiers. The exiles were able to raise partly from their own resources, and partly from the contributions of well-wishers in Holland, a sum sufficient for the two expeditions. Very little was obtained from London. Six thousand pounds had been expected thence. But instead of the money came excuses from Wildman, which ought to have opened the eyes of all who were not willfully blind. The Duke made up the deficiency by pawning his own jewels and those of Lady Wentworth. Arms, ammunition, and provisions were bought, and several ships which lay at Amsterdam were freighted. It is remarkable that the most illustrious and the most grossly injured man among the British exiles stood far aloof from these rash counsels. John Locke hated tyranny and persecution as a philosopher, but his intellect and his temper preserved him from the violence of a partisan. 
he had lived on confidential terms with Shaftesbury, and had thus incurred the displeasure of the court. Locke's prudence had, however, been such that it would have been to little purpose to bring him even before the corrupt and partial tribunals of that age. In one point, however, he was vulnerable. He was a student of Christ Church in the University of Oxford. It was determined to drive him from that celebrated college the greatest man of whom it could ever boast. But this was not easy. Locke had, at Oxford, abstained from expressing any opinion on the politics of the day. Spies had been set about him. Doctors of divinity and masters of arts had not been ashamed to perform the vilest of all offices, that of watching the lips of a companion in order to report his words to his ruin. The conversation in the hall had been purposely turned into irritating topics, to the exclusion bill and to the character of the Earl of Shaftesbury, but in vain. Locke neither broke out nor dissembled but maintained such steady silence and composure as forced the tools of power to own with vexation that never man was so complete a master of his tongue and of his passions. When it was found that treachery could do nothing, arbitrary power was used. After vainly trying to inveigle Locke into a fault, the government resolved to punish him without one. Orders came from Whitehall that he should be ejected and those orders the dean and canons made haste to obey. Locke was travelling on the continent for his health when he learned that he had been deprived of his home and of his bread, without a trial or even a notice. The injustice with which he had been treated would have excused him if he had resorted to violent methods of redress, but he was not to be blinded by personal resentment. He augured no good from the schemes of those who had assembled at Amsterdam, and he quietly repaired to Utrecht, where, while his partners in misfortune were planning their own destruction, he employed himself in writing his celebrated letter on toleration. The English government was early apprised that something was in agitation among the outlaws. An invasion of England seems not to have been at first expected, but it was apprehended that Argyle would shortly appear in arms among his clansmen. A proclamation was accordingly issued, directing that Scotland should be put into a state of defence. The militia was ordered to be in readiness. All the clans hostile to the name of Campbell were set in motion. John Murray, Marquess of Athol, was appointed Lord Lieutenant of Argyleshire, and, at the head of a great body of his followers, occupied the castle of Inverary. Some suspected persons were arrested. Others were compelled to give hostages. Ships of war were sent to cruise near the Isle of Bute, and part of the army of Ireland was moved to the coast of Ulster. While these preparations were making in Scotland, James called into his closet Arnold Van Sitters, who had long resided in England as ambassador from the United Provinces and Everard van Dykvelt, who, after the death of Charles, had been sent by the State-General on a special mission of condolence and congratulation. The king said that he had received from unquestionable sources intelligence of designs which were forming against the throne by his banished subjects in Holland. Some of the exiles were cutthroats, whom nothing but the special providence of God had prevented from committing a foul murder and among them was the owner of the spot which had been fixed for the butchery. Of all living men, said the king, Argyle has the greatest means of annoying me, and of all places Holland is that whence a blow may be best aimed against me. The Dutch envoys assured his majesty that what he had said should instantly be communicated to the government which they represented and expressed their full confidence that every exertion would be made to satisfy him. They were justified in expressing this confidence. Both the Prince of Orange and the States General were at this time most desirous that the hospitality of their country should not be abused for purposes which the English government could justly complain. James had lately held language which encouraged the hope that he would not patiently submit to the ascendancy of France it seemed probable that he would consent to form a close alliance with the United Provinces and the House of Austria. 
There was, therefore, at The Hague, an extreme anxiety to avoid all that could give him offence. The personal interest of William was also on this occasion identical with the interest of his father-in-law. But the case was one which required rapid and vigorous action, and the nature of the Batavian institutions made such action almost impossible. The Union of Utrecht, rudely formed, admits the agonies of a revolution for the purpose of meeting immediate exigencies, had never been deliberately revised and perfected in a time of tranquillity. Every one of the seven commonwealths which that union had bound together retained almost all their rights of sovereignty, and asserted those rights punctiliously against the central government. As the federal authorities had not the means of exacting prompt obedience from the provincial authorities, so the provincial authorities had not the means of exacting prompt obedience from the municipal authorities. Holland alone contained eighteen cities, each of which was, for many purposes, an independent state, jealous of all interference from without. If the rulers of such a city received from the Hague an order which was unpleasing to them, they either neglected it altogether, or executed it languidly and tardily. In some town councils, indeed, the influence of the Prince of Orange was all-powerful. But unfortunately, the place where the British exiles had congregated, and where their ships had been fitted out, was the rich and populous Amsterdam. And the magistrates of Amsterdam were the heads of the faction hostile to the federal government and to the House of Nassau. The naval administration of the United Provinces was conducted by five distinct boards of admiralty. One of those boards, Sate at Amsterdam, was partly nominated by the authorities of that city, and seems to have been entirely animated by their spirit. All the endeavors of the federal government to effect what James desired were frustrated by the invasions of the functionaries of Amsterdam, and by the blunders of Colonel Bevel Skelton who had just arrived at the Hague as envoy from England. Skelton had been born in Holland during the English troubles, and was therefore supposed to be peculiarly qualified for his post. But he was, in truth, unfit for that and for every other diplomatic situation. Excellent judges of character pronounced him to be the most shallow, fickle, passionate, presumptuous, and garrulous of men. He took no serious notice of the proceedings of the refugees, till three vessels which had been equipped for the expedition to Scotland were safe out of the Zyder Zee, till the arms, ammunition, and provisions were on board, and till the passengers had embarked. Then, instead of applying, as he should have done, to the States General, who sate close to his own door, he sent a messenger to the magistrates of Amsterdam with a request that the suspected ships might be detained. The magistrates of Amsterdam answered that the entrance of the Zyder Zee was out of their jurisdiction, and referred him to the federal government. It was notorious that this was a mere excuse, and that if there had been any real wish at the Stadthouse of Amsterdam to prevent Argyle from sailing, no difficulties would have been made. Skelton now addressed himself to the States General. They showed every disposition to comply with his demand, and as the case was urgent, departed from the course which they ordinarily observed in the transaction of business. On the same day on which he made his application to them, an order, drawn in exact conformity with his request, was dispatched to the Admiralty of Amsterdam. But this order, in consequence of some misinformation, did not correctly describe the situation of the ships. They were said to be in the Texel. They were in the Vlie. The Admiralty of Amsterdam made this error a plea for doing nothing, and before the error could be rectified, the three ships had sailed. The last hours which Argyle passed on the coast of Holland were hours of great anxiety. Near him lay a Dutch man-of-war whose broadside would in a moment have put an end to his expedition. Round his little fleet a boat was rowing in which were some persons with telescopes whom he suspected to be spies. But no effectual step was taken for the purpose of detaining him, and on the afternoon of the 2nd of May he stood out to sea before a favorable breeze. The voyage was prosperous. 
On the 6th, the Orkneys were in sight. Argyle, very unwisely, anchored off Kirkwall, and allowed two of his followers to go on shore there. The bishop ordered them to be arrested. The refugees proceeded to hold a long and animated debate on this misadventure, for, from the beginning to the end of their expedition, however languid and irresolute their conduct might be, they never in debate wanted spirit or perseverance. Some were for an attack on Kirkwall, some were for proceeding without delay to Argyleshire. At last the Earl seized some gentlemen who lived near the coast of the island, and proposed to the bishop an exchange of prisoners. The bishop returned no answer, and the fleet, after losing three days, sailed away. This delay was full of danger. It was speedily known at Edinburgh that the rebel squadron had touched at the Orkneys. Troops were instantly put in motion. When the Earl reached his own province, he found that preparations had been made to repel him. At Dunstaffnag he sent his second son, Charles, on shore to call the Campbells to arms. But Charles returned with gloomy tidings. The herdsmen and fishermen were indeed ready to rally around Macallamore, but of the heads of the clan some were in confinement, and others had fled. Those gentlemen who remained at their homes were either well affected to the government, or afraid of moving, and refused even to see the son of their chief. From Dunstaffnag the small armament proceeded to Campbelltown, near the southern extremity of the peninsula of Kintyre. Here the Earl published a manifesto, drawn up in Holland, under the direction of the committee, by James Stuart, a Scotch advocate, whose pen was, a few months later, employed in a very different way. In this paper were set forth, with a strength of language sometimes approaching to scurrility, many real and some imaginary grievances. It was hinted that the late king had died by poison. A chief object of the expedition was declared to be the entire suppression, not only of popery, but of prelacy, which was termed the most bitter root and offspring of popery and all good Scotchmen were exhorted to do valiantly for the cause of their country and of their God. End of Part 3